welcome to this evening's lecture. A collaboration among the Department of Physics, the Baylor Society for Conversations in Religion, Ethics, and Science, the Baylor Student Chapter, the American Scientific Affiliation, and the Institute for Faith and Learning. I'm Darren Davis, a member of the philosophy faculty here at Baylor and also a director of the Institute for Faith and Learning. And on behalf of my colleagues, we're delighted that you're here this evening. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Brother Guy Consolano. A native of Detroit, Michigan, he earned degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology before taking his PhD in planetary science from the University of Arizona in 1978. From 1978 through 80, he was a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at the Harvard College Observatory, and from 1980 to 83, he continued as a postdoc and lecturer at MIT. In 1983, he left MIT to join the U.S. Peace Corps, where he served for two years in Kenya, teaching physics and astronomy. Upon his return to the U.S. in 1985, he became an assistant professor of physics at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, where he taught until, until his entry into the Jesuit order in 1989. He took vows as a Jesuit brother in 1991 and studied philosophy and theology at Loyola University of Chicago and physics at the University of Chicago before his assignment to the Vatican Observatory in 1993. He currently serves as curator of the Vatican Meteorite Collection in Castel Gandolfo, one of the largest collections in the world. His research explores the connections between meteorites and asteroids and the origin and evolution of small bodies in the solar system. He serves on the boards of several national and international astronomical societies and for his contributions to the study of meteorites and asteroids the International Astronomical Union honored him with the name of Asteroid 4597 Consolano. <laughs> Among his several books are The Way to the Dwelling of the Life, Brother Astronomer, and God's Mechanics. He has lectured internationally and is a frequent guest on radio and television programs. Brother Guy is a person of rare gifts a renowned astronomer, prolific author, engaging public lecturer, and Jesuit brother. He helps us to reflect upon the so often assumed conflict between faith and science. Brother Guy's vision is cast towards the heavens in his vocation as an astronomer, and he does so as one committed to science because it reveals the part of divine creation. Thus, he helps us to see that faith and science are not really odds but rather depend on one another. This is Brother Guy's first visit to Baylor, and I know you want to join me in offering him a warm welcome. He offers for us this evening a presentation titled The Virtuous Astronomer, How the Work of Science is Shaped by the Virtues of Faith, Hope, and Love. Please join me in welcoming Brother Guy Consolano. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a lot of pretty pictures that I'm going to be showing overhead um, once these words get out of the way. Uh, my thought is that anybody who invites an astronomer should at least get pretty pictures out of the talk, even if the words don't mean any sense. <laughs> so feel free to look at them, but if you don't see them, for the most part, they don't have a whole lot of connection with what I'm saying. <laughs> what I actually want to do this evening is not so much astronomy, but not to look at astronomy, to look at instead the astronomer. Not what we are seeing, but the reasons behind looking in the first place. I'm a Jesuit brother. Although I'm not ordained, I don't lead public prayer, I don't say mass, as I tell my Catholic friends, I can hear your confession, but I can't forgive you. <laughs> I do live in community with the priests who are ordained. And we are all united by our common vows of poverty and chastity and obedience and by our work as astronomers. I see the world of astronomy as a microcosm that reflects how we human beings motivate ourselves to do things that bring no obvious benefit as the world sees benefit, you know, 
uh, money or sex or power. Think of those vows that I took. <laughs> How do we motivate ourselves to work together on things that none of us could do on our own and things that are not going to make any of us rich? It's, that, that, that's a huge topic. But rather than delve into the sociology of science, which is fascinating in itself, I want to limit myself to a much narrower focus to concentrate not on the politics of our work, but on its soul, on the virtues that sustain astronomy and all astronomers, Jesuit or not, believers or not. What sustains us astronomers moment to moment in our pursuit of knowledge? What are the underlying qualities that not only determine whether or not we're good scientists, but make us want to be scientists in the first place? To me, that question is where science meets religion. Now, it's commonplace to talk about the endless war between science and religion, and one commonplace way to resolve this war is to say, well, science and religion each have their own realm of applicability. Stephen Jay Gould said this in his book, uh, Rocks of Ages. He used the phrase, they're non-overlapping magisteria. So the idea is, well, I do the science during the week, I do religion on Sunday, I don't care about how they mix, I don't let them mix. Those, however, who would put up this watertight barrier between science and religion miss one really important point. Science and religion do intersect without doubt in one place, in the human being who is the scientist in the human being whose ultimate motivations and yearnings to pursue that science are overtly or not religious. In the human being whose religious assumptions about the universe form the foundation for scientific reasoning. And also, just to get this out of the way, let's also remember that it's a cliche to equate all religions with the strictest form of creationism, one that says the world was created in exactly seven days, Genesis is our only science text, or to think that all scientists treat their science as their religion and preach that there is no God but biology and Dawkins is his prophet. <laughs> but there is a good reason why some good sincere and very smart people are creationists, while other equally good, sincere and smart people have abandoned religion for a materialistic vision of science. The reason may be that both views are at, le at least partly right. As the theologians remind us, every heresy is based on an important truth. If it didn't have some truth to it, it wouldn't be appealing. If it wasn't important, it wouldn't be worth being a heresy. In order for an atheist to say that he doesn't believe in God, that atheist must have a really clear picture of the God it is that they don't believe in. Otherwise, how would they know that they didn't believe in it? And the God that the atheists reject may well be a God worth rejecting. You know, one who is far indeed from the God that we believers have experienced and embrace. And I remind you, we believe in God because we experience God. We don't believe in God ultimately from some blind faith in a book or a guru. We believe in God as a response to an experience. You know, at the very least, the experience of the guru or the book. But even there, inevitably reinforced by our own experience of God. In that sense, we are no different from the scientist who observes and then tries to make sense of what is observed. The atheist denies the reality of those experiences or claims that our understanding of them is false, that we're just projecting God onto our data, and data that could be explained in other ways. The theist claims that the atheist is the one who's throwing away the data by refusing to admit the reality of any experience that doesn't fit their preconceived view of the universe. And undoubtedly, there have been times when each side has been right. By rejecting supernatural intervention in the universe, for instance, 
God re uh, science rejects a God of chaos, a God without laws, a God who operates on a whim, who makes no sense. Fact of the matter is, Christianity rejects that kind of God too. Science rejects a God who mutters, let there be at random, a simple or arbitrary God who creates by whim or at random. It's inconsistent with the complex but rule-bound nature of the universe that we've observed. But though the God of Genesis does indeed create literally by fiat, let there be, it is not at random. His rhyme and rhythm are also there. The story of Genesis tells us that creation was done in stages, step by step, with the most subtle hints of an ultimate plan. So in that case, you know, the young earth creationists are right too. When they insist that discarding the Genesis story of creation and fall would mean throwing away the only clue we're ever going to get of the why and the wherefore of the universe. Of course, very few believers are young earthers. And even so, even the young earthers I know, they, they drive cars, they surf the web, they happily live in a technology and a worldview that is far removed from ancient Palestine. Indeed, my biggest argument with the young earthers is that in a funny way, they embrace science too much. They give it too much credit. Creation is good enough for me. It doesn't gain anything, rather the contrary to dress it up as creation science. And as it turns out, most scientists are not, strictly speaking, atheists. The proportion you'd find on church on Sunday, or in a synagogue on Saturday, or in a mosque on Friday, is actually pretty much the same as the general public at large, wherever you happen to find them. Probably more than half in Texas, probably about 10% in England. It measures and it mirrors the, the culture that they come from. Among my acquaintances, I've seen that even those astronomers who don't belong to an organized religion still are at most, most often theists, or at the very least agnostics, who suspect the existence of a god but never expect to know him. Most of the non-churched astronomers I've found would agree with Carl Sagan who once said, you know, an atheist is somebody who knows more than I do. Few scientists claim to be atheists. And even an atheist scientist must still worship at the altar of truth. At least we all agree the good ones do. Truth matters, even when it's not in your immediate best interest to admit the result of your experiment, or observation, or improved calculation, if it goes against your pet theory. Even when you know that, you know, you could fake your data and probably no one would ever know, at least not until you got tenure. <laughs> this dedication to an abstract ideal, truth, is not all that different from the worship of a God who proclaims to be the way, the truth, and the life. Um, incidentally, if you can't read the, the thing, that's Edwin Aldrin, the first the second person on the moon. You can see the first person on the moon. You can actually see him. I think in the um, reflection of Neil Armstrong that you're looking there, because he's the one who took that picture. And that's the communion chalice that he took with him on the moon, as he was a member of the Presbyterian uh, Church in uh, Webster City. And I've actually been to that church and seen that chalice. He had 15 minutes when he had a Presbyterian communion service. Now, mind you, it's Presbyterian. It wasn't Catholic. It wasn't the real thing. But still. <laughs> The biggest issue to those scientists who are agnostics is the question of a personal God who acts in our daily lives. But even the most unreligious of scientists looks in nature for a key, a, a rhythm, a sense of familiar, a, a, a kind of a characteristic pattern, one that has succeeded in the past in providing a useful description of how things work, and so therefore a pattern that can give you a clue to future research. They show you opportunities for further understanding. As anyone who does science knows, the hardest part in the long run of being a scientist is not doing the science. It's coming up with the right question. One that is worth studying for a couple of years, but one that you have a hope will actually give you an answer in time for the next grant proposal. 
And the way you do that is by seeing how you have seen nature behave in the past. So that when you see a problem and you see all the different possible ways you could study it, you go, I'm going to put my money in this one. That's the one that feels right. For lack of a better phrase, nature has a personality. And a successful scientist is one who is familiar enough with that personality to recognize when a theory gets it right or when a possible theory gets it wrong. You know, you know your favorite characters on a TV show when a new writer comes in and tries to write for those characters? You can tell when they get them right or when they get them wrong. In the same way, a badly worked out theory will set a good scientist's teeth on edge, even before they get to go through the math of finding out why it doesn't work. It's that teeth on edge intuition that motivates them to do the math in the first place. Those religious scientists who, uh, those religious believers whose mistrust of science has kept them distanced from science may never learn the personality of nature that the scientist has come to know by doing science. But on the other hand, they may well know the person whose personality the scientists are only intuiting by doing the science. Recall how the God of Genesis remarks on creation, judging it good. Likewise, even the most atheistic of scientists has to experience that sense of joy, that simple happiness, that sense of rightness when they uncover the elegance in nature reflected in the laws of science. The great astronomer Johannes Kepler referred to the mathematical motions of the planets among the stars as echoing what he called the music of the spheres. In the book of Job, the Lord speaks of the moment of creation and he says, and I quote, when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. The harmony of the morning stars is poetry of the highest order. It reminds us that, in its essence, creation is a source of joy. As with music, it takes skill and talent to perform our research. But as with music, anyone can gaze on that beauty and rejoice, just as a non-musician can delight in the harmonies of a beautiful piece of music. The scientific work of astronomy demonstrates that the whole universe operates on divine laws Laws that make up a pleasing and consistent whole. The beauty of the stars and the nebula resulting from those laws is the expression of that joyous harmony. It motivates everything we do. But to actually do the work requires more. Nowadays, it requires a close familiarity with math and physics, with chemistry and biology. And it also depends on the three virtues the three virtues described in St. Paul. In order to do science, you must accept articles of faith, hope, and love that are quite frankly religious in nature. And I can show you they're religious because I can point out, if you look at them closely, they are articles that not all religions actually believe in. We start with faith. St. Ansel famously described theology as faith-seeking understanding. OK, but, but what is faith really? And, and how does that relate to science? Well, if theology means faith-seeking understanding, then clearly faith is something that's not understood, at least not in and of itself. And, and yet it is something important enough that we do try to understand it. In science, we know what that something is that we're trying to understand. It's the experience, experience again, the experience of truth. Raw, simple, direct. We know something is happening, but we don't know what, what it is, do we? I'm not speaking here of the truth that we come to in science after a long labor. What I'm talking about is the truth that we experience, that we start with axiomatically. The truth of the experience on which we construct the way we understand everything else we experience. It's the axiom on which we base our lives. In that sense, that kind of faith 
is an essential element of science. You know, if nothing else, you have to have faith that there is an objective reality, one that we can know. If you're going to be a scientist, you have to believe that the world is not an illusion. I'm not just a butterfly dreaming that I'm a Jesuit brother. <laughs> the, the philosophy of solipsism, that, that all of reality is actually just a project, a projection of my imagination, you don't really exist. It's just because I had a really bad cup of coffee this morning. You can't believe that and be a scientist. Or unless you do quantum physics, but that's a different issue. <laughs> And, and even if you were a solipsist and tried to do quantum physics, who would publish your papers? You know, what would be the point? <laughs> I'm reminded of the, of the old story of the, the woman who came up to George Bernard Shaw once and she said, but, but, but I am a solipsist and so are most of my friends. <laughs> Science accepts on faith that the universe operates according to laws. Laws that human reason is capable of grasping, at least in part. Nowadays, we accept the reality of a rational universe quite easily because we've seen from experience it works. <coughs> Using those laws, we can predict eclipses, cure diseases, make jet planes, make iPods. Where did that faith come from a thousand years ago, before we had jet planes and iPods? Where did that faith come from before we knew it was going to work? There are historians of science who have argued that the faith that gave us the courage to look for the laws of science before we knew there were laws came from believing in the God of Genesis, the God who created in an orderly way. They argue that that's why such a scientific worldview flourished precisely in the cultures formed by the religions, Judaism and Christianity and Islam, that accepted the God of Genesis. So, it's worth looking at how those religions reconcile the existence of the laws of physics with the existence of a creator God. And to do that, I'm stealing wildly from uh, Father Bill Steger, who works at our observatory, and who's written a lot on this topic. He points out, that there's a principle common to Jewish, Christian, and Islamic philosophy traditions. And that is the idea that God created the universe from nothing. Curatio ex nihilo, as the philosophers put it. And you find this actually in a very funny place. It's in the book of Maccabees. And it's on a totally different uh, topic. You know, they're, they're about to be tortured to death. And to give them courage, the mother says to one of the sons, remember that we believe in the God who created from nothing. It's like, where the heck did that come from? But there it is in the Bible. And obviously, by the time Maccabees was written, this was a commonplace that everyone in Judaism had accepted. It's not actually the way it's described in Genesis. You know, their theology developed. Now, there's a great difference between the nothing that the philosophers are talking about here and the physicist's idea of a vacuum. Even when there's no material substance presence, as you might find in deep space far away from any galaxy, that deep space still has space. It still has time. It still has the laws of physics that allow physics to operate in these places in this time. By contrast, what the philosophers are talking about is not empty space, but the very reason that space and time it itself can exist. None of the laws of nature in themselves can provide the ultimate source of either order or existence. Physics is incapable of doing that. Physics can describe the ultimate order, but it can't describe why there should be an ultimate order. It always has to start with something, a potential field, an energy, that then well-defined states of that something. These must possess some dynamical regularities or order, and then physics can describe how you get from one state to another, to some subsequent state, what had to precede a given state, presupposing the existence of time and space. And so physics and the other natural sciences are simply in principle not capable of providing the level of ultimate grounding and explanation that creation itself does. What the natural sciences investigate 
are the secondary causes, everything that happens in this creative arena, the creative action of the creative, try this again. Thomas Aquinas talks about primary causes, secondary causes. Physics describes secondary causes. The primary cause is the creator, the act of the creator. It's a different category of cause than the kinds of causes that physics talks about. In that sense, theologians speak not only of creatio ex nihilo, creation from nothing, but also creatio continua, the fact that at every instant the continued existence of the universe itself must be deliberately willed by God, who in this way is continually causing the universe to remain created. As much as we can talk about this thing without talking within the, in the language of time and place, which itself is created. In the theological tradition, we know that the character of our description of divine creative action, and indeed our language about God, can only be seen as a poetic analogy for the reality. God as the reason for why everything exists is not just another entity along with the entities of reality, not just another law of physics. God is not just the guy who wound up the clock at the beginning. God is not just, you know, it's a completely different level. God is supernatural. And not all religions believe in a supernatural God. The ancient pagan religions didn't believe in a supernatural god. They believed in nature gods. Hinduism has a whole you know, pantheon of nature gods. And it's interesting that the Romans and the Hindus, who they had fabulous cultures and many things that we have borrowed from and, and couldn't live without, they didn't do natural science. They didn't study the universe just for the fun of studying the universe. Along with this, it's essential to remember that God's action in the universe is radically different from other actions and causes. God's action in the universe enables and empowers and gives existence to the rest of the actions of the universe without substituting for them or intervening among them. God's action in the universe is not so much that it brings about change, rather it's what makes change possible. Or the whole issue of God's action in the universe is one of these unsolved mysteries that you can go back and explore over and over and over again and will never exist the mystery of how God acts in the universe. The point is here that we understand that both science and religion are concerned with creation, with nature of reality, the origin of things. Both of them are involved with issues of truth. So to hold them separately in watertight boxes is, is a sterile solution. It smacks of dishonesty. And yet, in a fundamental way, science and religion are very different. Religion starts with faith, as I've argued, believing in the truth of the raw experience is something we accept as truth, complete and beyond question. When God speaks, it is indeed God and not some human-made substitute. But God's truth is passed to us through the medium of human beings, the authors of scripture, the teachers of tradition. Jesus himself was also, by his own choice, human. So even if we'd been there listening directly to his words, our concept of what he was trying to say would be limited by the human language he used, by our human limitations, by our own frail human understanding. Um, if I may dare say the old phrase, blessed are the cheese makers. If you know the movie, you know the reference. Day by day, as we exist now, we must rely on our all too fragile grasp of our own personal religious experience and try to sort out which is an authentic religious experience and which is our own delusions or worse yet, something from outside ourselves but not from God. The whole Jesuit spirituality of discernment of spirits comes into this because you can't believe everything you hear, including what you hear in your heart. 
So, religion starts with truth, all right, but it only begins to approach understanding. On the other hand, science consists of human-made theories. Because they're human-made, we can completely understand them. But they only approximate the truth. Because they're fully human, we can test and understand them. But because they're human, they're always going to be limited, inadequate. We hope that they can lead us toward an ineffable truth beyond science's complete understanding. That's our hope. But science starts with understanding and yet only approaches truth. That's the human experience. We spend our lives in the road linking truth and understanding. Scientists go one way, believers go the other way. Those of us who are both keep going back and forth, we get to experience both. It's a two-way street. Faith is both the starting point and the goal. But if faith is the end point of that street, hope is what gives us the courage to go for a walk down that street. Hope is the certain expectation of future happiness, said the great medieval theologian Peter Lombard, who was cited with approval by Thomas Aquinas in the Summa. It is the center of the three virtues, and it depends on the three virtues. The certainty that Peter Lombard was speaking of is based on faith. The happiness that he was talking of is love. The key contribution of hope is the sense of expectation. The work of an astronomer is based on hope. Every astronomer goes to the telescope with the hope that the weather is going to cooperate, with the hope that the instruments are going to function right, with the hope that the object that we've decided to look at is actually going to lead to the data that we're looking for. We take these expectations for granted so much that even if we're faced with clouds or a crashing computer and realize this observing run is hopeless, we're still ready to return the next time and try again. In addition, an astronomer at the telescope has a different kind of expectation as well. The anticipation of wondering what unexpected things will result from our observations. As each new image comes up from the camera, we always look on it with excitement. This particular one came up on all the things on April Fool's Night. Uh, about two years ago. And if you notice very carefully, there's kind of a black blotch off to the left. That's because the very night that we got this incredibly exciting result was a night that moths were flying into the telescope camera. And there was a moth leg covering a quarter of the, the telescope chip. But what we saw was the nucleus of a Kuiper Belt object, the one we were looking for, and a cloud of gas next to it. If it was coming from the nucleus, it would be surrounding it. But it wasn't. It didn't. It moved from night to night relative to the nucleus. What's going on? We still haven't figured it out. <laughs> the best we can guess is that it was another piece that broke off and was flying in a similar orbit. But when it broke off and how long? This, this is an object out by Uranus. What kind of object gives off gases at that temperature? We still don't know. It's very exciting, and we still haven't figured it out. Likewise, big projects like a space probe or a large new telescope can only succeed if they are supported by hope. You know, to send a space probe to Mars costs at the minimum half a billion dollars and years of dedicated efforts from hundreds of human beings. There's a lot of human life that goes into making a space probe. And we know from experience that half of the probes we've sent to Mars have crashed and burned, haven't made it, haven't worked. But we continue to try because we have the hope that some of them are going to succeed and that the knowledge we gain will be worth the price. When the Vatican Observatory chose to build a telescope of a radically new design, it did so with the hope that the risks we took could be overcome in the hope that the advances to astronomy would be worth the risks. You know, in our case, the results of putting our faith into this design and all those who have worked lovingly to bring it forward and to continue to improve it 
have justified our hopes. Where do we get that confidence though? Not just the confidence that the night's observing is going to be fruitful, but indeed that there's anything to be learned from looking at the sky. There were some ancient cultures that thought that whatever occurs in the universe, whether it was the motions of the stars, the growth of crops, the weather, was just the result of the arbitrary whim of the gods. Other cultures described the universe as chaos, or worse than that, as a physical and moral morass, something to blot out of our consciousness. What gives us the confidence that the world is not chaos, that our scientific laws are more than just finding horses in the clouds, that the things we are studying don't just happen merely by the whim of the gods. A scientist insists that there's a reason why crops grow. It's not the action of Ceres, goddess of crops. There's a reason why lightning strikes. It's not just the anger of Zeus, the god of thunder. There's a reason why diseases occur. It's not just the will of God or, as the disciples tried to argue with Jesus, the result of somebody's sin. Indeed, that's the danger of certain kinds of religious belief. If you invoke God instead of, dare I say, evolution, you run the risk of turning God into yet another nature God. But if God is above nature, supernatural. We human beings definitely are not. We are creatures. We are created in nature, from nature, of natural materials, and to dust we will return. And if human beings are a part of nature, then human life, even the human psyche, may all possibly be subject to the same manipulation of the material world that can be applied to building houses or growing crops or making lightning rods. One cures diseases, even diseases of the soul, by technique, not by magic. That's what G.K. Chesterton meant when he was writing his short history of England 100 years ago. He noted, and I'm quoting, a mystical materialism marked Christianity from its birth. The very soul of it was a body. Among the stoical philosophies and oriental, oriental negations that were its first foes, it fought fiercely and particularly for a supernatural freedom to cure concrete maladies by concrete substances. And so we are invited, I might even say demanded, by God to learn about God by studying God's universe. We are invited to be techies, to be engineers, to build the things that make our lives easier and better. We are invited to be doctors and psychiatrists and to cure disease. We are invited to be astronomers. It is because that invitation comes from God that we have the certain expectation, the hope that in the beauty of the stars and in the beauty of the laws that govern the stars, we will discover him who is the source of all law and all beauty and all truth. Finally, in order to do science, you have to believe that science is worth doing. Which goes to the heart of the question, you know, why do we do it at all? Do you study the stars? to gain power or money or security by predicting the future the way the astrologers do it? Do you study the stars to improve the timing of growing crops the way the calendar makers in the ancient world did it? You know, our, our calendars actually work pretty well. We don't need astronomers to do that anymore. And our science has shown that, you know, astrology actually doesn't work. Just as our scriptures told us that uh, astrology was an abuse, a denial of free will and the power of God. So, why do we do astronomy? The original work of the astronomers at the Vatican had a very practical bet. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII organized a commission to reform the calendar and he had the Jesuit mathematician Christopher Clavius explain it to the public. 
But with that work done, Jesuit astronomers continued charting the heavens, observing planets and comets, building the first reflecting telescope. A pontifical observatory at the Roman College was formally established in 1774. It had the task of keeping track of the weather, recording earthquakes, marking the passage of the sun across the meridian every day. They, they'd drop a big ball, which could be seen from a, a, a fort across the way. When they saw the ball drop they, at the fort, they'd fire off a cannon. Everybody in Rome then knew it was loon, and they would, they would set their clocks that way. But they did more than that. Pope Pius VII observed a near total solar eclipse at the observatory in 1804. Father Etienne Dumochel and Francesco de Vico were the first to recover Comet Halley in 1535. Father Angelo Secchi in the 1860s developed a classification scheme for the spectra of stars, classifying more than 4,000 stars into different populations by their spectral features. Why did they do that? When Pope Leo XIII in 1891 established the modern version of the Vatican Observatory, it was to show the world how the church supported science. But he was building on centuries of astronomical research done for nothing more than the glory of God's creation. All astronomers, even those of us who make a living at it, all of us are amateurs which we all know the word amateur means someone who does it for love. And that's a radical assertion. Not every religion would see studying the physical universe as worthy of love. After all, if your goal in life is to reach nirvana through meditation, leaving behind this evil, corrupting universe the way the Manichaeans taught, then you're not going to be a scientist. Because being a scientist means wallowing in, getting your fingernails dirty with this miserable, corrupting, sinful universe. On the other hand, if you believe in the God who, uh, you know the guy who used to show up at the football games with the big sign, John 3.16? I assume at a Baptist school somebody here can tell me what John 3.16 says. <laughs> Among Catholics, I'm less sure of that, but uh, anybody, John 3.16. A lot, lot, lot. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. Yeah, 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 got it, got far enough, good enough. <laughs> For God so loved the world. It doesn't say God liked people or nice ideas or pure meditation. It says God loved the world. This stuff. So much that he sent his only begotten son. It's only if you believe in a God who loved his only son that you'll believe that studying this world is a good thing because it's a way of becoming intimate with its maker. In a book called On the Incarnation, written in the year 300 AD, St. Athanasius explicitly stated that creation is good, that it is a path to lead us to God. And here's a long quote here, I'll read it to you. If a man looks to heaven, he sees there God's ordering. If a man has been immersed in the element of water and thinks that that's God, because the Egyptians worship water, he may see its very nature changed by God and learn that the Lord is creator of it all. If a man has even gone down to Hades, even there he can still see the fact of Christ's resurrection. For the Lord touched all parts of creation, and freed and undeceived them all from every deceit. Thus man, enclosed on every side by the works of creation, everywhere in heaven and Hades, in men and on the earth, beholds the unfolded Godhead of the Word. Athanasius argues against those who would assume creation is evil, and he brings forth the insight that by participating personally in creation, through the Incarnation, God has elevated the status of nature while still remaining separate from nature. We find God in the element of water, for instance, not because water is divine, but because it is a creation and therefore an expression of God. By implication, Athanasius 
suggests that the honor and duty of one who knows and loves God is to know and love God's creation. In other words, God told us we should be scientists. And that's why the Vatican supports an astronomical observatory. Why do we as Jesuits become astronomers? Well, let's observe the observers ourselves. If you were to observe the observers, what do you see going on day by day at the Vatican Observatory? <laughs> Our home in, in uh, the mountains of Arizona. One thing you'd see, a week spent in near silence awake all night on a cold, lonely mountaintop under a starlit sky, quietly moving a telescope from star field to star field, typing a few commands in a computer, waiting for the starlight to be gathered into a frozen chip of silicon. Or you'd see a noisy meeting room at a convention hotel filled with a thousand other scientists, old colleagues from graduate school, new grad students meeting each other for the first time. And amidst all the noise, you hear your friends talking about new discoveries, worried about their next grant, worried about their next job, overflowing with news of marriages or births or divorces, terrified because they're about to try to cram a year's worth of work into a 10-minute presentation before 500 ultra-critical colleagues. And then one of them comes up to you and says, can I talk to you just in private, just for a few minutes? The, uh, the meeting up there, by the way, that's the IAU uh, meeting in Prague that demoted Pluto. <laughs> the person who was on the committee that worked out that compromise I was on that committee. Yes, I demoted Pluto and I do it again. <laughs> and the one who actually wrote the final resolution that passed was another Jesuit priest at the Vatican Observatory. <laughs> actually, the whole Pluto story is much more complicated and I've tried explaining why, but finally I decided just playing the evil scientist is much easier. <laughs> what else do you see? You might see somebody in a classroom before a bunch of high school students. Their minds scattered in a million different directions, trying to entice them with the glorious colors of galaxies and nebulae into a deeper contemplation of creation and self and creator. Or you might see a computer screen which doesn't show beautiful color images, but stars as random dots of black and white amidst every flaw in the detective chip, every speck of dust on the filter, the shadow of the moth that happened to fly into the camera. And from all of that, you've got to extract the brightness of one particular dot by counting the number of times a photon knocked an electron from your detector chip. And you know the relentless mathematical law that says the value we arrive at is going to be no better statistically than the square root of the number of hits and you hope that your count doesn't also include the light from some distant galaxy that also happened to be in the chip at the same time. And then you realize that that faint, anonymous, distant galaxy that's getting in the way of your data is a collection of 100 billion stars. Each star likely surrounded by planets. And even if life is a one in a million chance, that would still mean 100 billion thousand places in that little smudge where there could be alien astronomers looking back at you, muttering about that distant image of the Milky Way that's getting in the way of their observations. <laughs> or in our work, you might see 25 brilliant young graduate students from around the world meeting in the Pope's summer home south of Rome for a month to learn more about astronomy and to make those friendships that are going to be renewed at scientific meetings for the rest of their lives. You might see somebody looking through a microscope at a thin slice of a meteorite, wondering what part of the asteroid belt could have provided those shocks, melted those minerals. Or you might be somebody explaining for the hundredth report of this year why the church supports an observatory, why there's nothing new to say about the aliens or the Star of Bethlehem or the Da Vinci Code, why the Galileo story is a whole lot more complicated than the story everybody knows and yet just as embarrassing to the church which is an embarrassment you feel personally because you love your science, but you love your church too. 
You'd see another long trip into Rome through traffic to get from Castel Gandolfo to the Vatican. You drive past busy nuns. You drive past suited functionaries. You drive past the Swiss guards. You speak to some official in a language neither of you speaks very well. And you're talking about a visa or a project or some accounting issue. Or you just see somebody who steps outside late at night just to look up, to look at the stars. That's what goes on in that observatory. The year 2009, last year, was the International Year of Astronomy. We celebrated the 400th anniversary of the night that Galileo first pointed his telescope to the sky. As astronomers and representative of the Vatican, which was a national participant in the organizations that sponsored the International Year, we Jesuits were visible participants in its activities. We had meetings on topics from astrobiology to astronomy and culture. We were involved in films and planetarium shows and blogs, and we put out this book. But even before Galileo first ground his lens, Jesuits were working in astronomy. Christopher Clavius reformed the calendar 1582 and wrote the book to explain it. Christopher Clavius also wrote a letter of recommendation to a young Galileo when Galileo was looking for a job. Other Jesuits from the Roman College and elsewhere devised the first telescope, mapped the moon. We talked about some of those things. All of those forebears did their work in meetings and classrooms and alone with the telescope. They had moments of private spiritual conversation. Father Hagen, the director of the Vatican Observatory, was a spiritual director of St. Elizabeth Hasselblad. They attended weddings and baptisms and funerals for their colleagues, just as we do, including a lot of guys who would feel uncomfortable around other clergymen. And our work continues. The Vatican supports an observatory and asks the Jesuits to staff it in order to show in a visible way that it doesn't fear science, that it embraces science. And it, this follows the long tradition of seeing knowledge of the created world as a path to the creator. And the reasons why we astronomers are as old, and the, and the reasons why we are astronomers is as old as the stars themselves, expressed in poetry since poets first wrote. The prophet Baruch spoke of the stars at their posts who shine and rejoice. When he calls them, they answer, here we are, shining with joy for their maker. Dante ended his divine comedy by referring to the love that moves the heavens and the other stars. St. Ignatius, our founder, wrote that his greatest consolation came from the contemplation of the heavens and the stars, which he would gaze at long and often, because from them there was born in him the strongest impulse to serve our Savior. Call it consolation. Call it joy. Call it love. It's in season every year. It is the study of the universe, the all things where if one finds God. It's the work of the Vatican Observatory. It's the work of every observatory. It's astronomy based on faith and hope, but especially on love. Thank you very much. I'll be uh, happy to take questions. Questions about anything from, you know, what does the Pope have for breakfast to, yeah.
if we find life on other planets, how does that fit in with Genesis? Um, well, you have to understand, of course, that Genesis is not science. I'm speaking as a Catholic. There will be those who disagree, but I also speak as a scientist. I've written science books. Trust me, there are no Bibles. Anyone who studies philosophy is going to read Plato, even though Plato is 2,000 years old. Anyone who studies literature is going to read Shakespeare, even though Shakespeare is 500 years old. Nobody who studies physics actually bothers reading Newton or Galileo, even though they're the, you know, the founders of our field. Why? Because Newton and Galileo are way out of date. Science books go out of date. You know what you do with a three-year-old science book? You throw it away. I don't want to do that to the Bible. Therefore, the Bible is not that kind of science book. There are at least three different creation stories in the Bible. They contradict each other. That's not the point. They don't contradict each other in the point that's important. It says no matter how you think the universe was created, here's the common thread. It was done by a loving God who did it deliberately, that we human beings are not by accident. That God willed us to exist. It doesn't rule out the possibility of other entities also worshiping God. For instance, the stars that shout for, jo for joy at the creation. For instance, the Nephilim mentioned briefly in chapter 6 of Genesis. You go, what? Well, who are they? What was that about? And they just kind of some, come and go. You know, and the sons of uh, God were, were mating with the, the children of, you know, huh, what was that about? What that's about, as far as we can tell, is it was another little bit of uh, Babylonian cosmology tossed in along with chapter 1, which was the best cosmology of the day 3,000 years ago, totally turned on its head by the creator of the book of Genesis, who said, where the Babylonians said this is the way the world was made and it was by accident, we're saying maybe the world was made that way, but it was no accident. In the very story of angels, we have an entire race of creatures who are in a loving relationship with God, who had to make a decision, and who have their own creation and redemption story. So, what does it mean to be created in the image and likeness of God? Aquinas would say that's referring to the human soul. That's referring to intellect and free will. The fact that I am able to know I exist and I am able to know that you exist and I'm able to do something about it. To say, let's be friends or get lost. Intellect and free will. Any entity that has intellect and free will is going to be faced with the same moral issues that you and I are faced with. And it's going to have to make the same kinds of decisions for or against God. So that the creation story of Genesis is as true for them as it is for us. Because it's the same creation story. Because it's the same universe. And they're not even aliens. They're our brothers, sisters, and whatever other genders they have. <laughs> It's actually a long, long medieval tradition on that very point of could there be other worlds? That was what they called the other world. And the answer, unambiguously, is yes, there could be. Yes? I know we've had so many people, but I wonder if you could speak to the role, first of all, in your life of having an active and personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and then also for others of that relationship that relates to what is, you know, What is the sense of having a personal relationship with Jesus in my role as a scientist? And as I mentioned in the book, it's actually a quite a complicated answer. Because as a scientist, I entered the Jesuits with a deep love of God the Creator, who we identify as God the Father. And this Jesus character, I'd read some nice stories about him, but I, you know. And somebody pointed out, you've just entered a group called the Society of Jesus. You'd better get to know who this Jesus guy was. And so it was, you know, it's been a long developing relationship trying to understand the nature of the Trinity. And the more I understand, the more I realize I don't understand. And that's important. I thought I had it figured out. And then some theologian said, yeah, yeah, the way you've expressed it there, that was explicitly condemned by the Council of Nicaea. Oh, all right, try again. <laughs> um, but part of that is, and to me, part of that is recognizing Jesus in 
this person and therefore in the people who I encounter. The incarnation of Jesus in humanity along with that particular person at that time. That very real person who existed. And it's very hard for a nerd like me to accept that Jesus can be found in human beings, especially those guys who beat me up when I was in high school. But, uh, but that's exactly what I have to accept. And that's exactly what I have to be able to do, to see Jesus. It's, you know, it's a path that I've only started. And those who have a great relationship with, with the second person, I admire and I can learn a lot from. It's not easy. And Red also recognized that all of us approach God in different directions. All of us have that experience of, you know, there, there's, there's somebody watching me. There's somebody, like you're walking down the street and you know there's somebody back there. And you don't know how you know it, but you know it. In the same way, I know there's a God. I don't know how I know it. I don't know what to do about it. It irritates the heck out of me sometimes. But I have to deal with it one way or another, even if it's to choose to ignore it. It's, as I say at the beginning of the talk, all religion, all faith starts with experience. Faith is our response to that experience. Yes? How does the dominion mandate uh, influence our science? I mean, you talked about doing it for love. Mm -hmm. Does that have an impact as well? Uh, the fact that we are you know, given dominion, which I, another way of saying that is we're given responsibility for nature. That uh, in, the, in the story of Genesis, one of those wonderful moments is Adam naming. In essence, again, he's being told to be the first scientist. Go out and classify the leaves. Go out and sort out one kind of star from another. I think that that is, again, a divine mandate to realize that we are part of this universe and we have, by, by reason of being creatures with intellect and free will, we have a responsibility to take care of it. But also, as anybody knows, once you start taking care of something, you love it in a way that you would never love it before. Over here, yeah. How do I think the quantum theory and the multiverse relates to the Bible? Um, I could be glib and say about the same way that the Bible tells me how to run my VCR. Uh, you know, it, it, the Bible doesn't talk about that. But there's a deeper sense, which I think is what you're going to. And that is, it reminds me, modern physics reminds me how little I know. That a hundred years ago, people would have laughed if we talked about the things that we now, people would have refused to believe the things that we now teach in physics classes. And we know that because we can name the famous physicists who refuse to believe in quantum theory even as their work laid the foundations for it, from Einstein to uh, Planck. It reminds me to be humble in the face of the universe. That's one reason why basing your religion on science is a really, really dangerous thing to do. Because a thousand years from now, people are going to laugh at the science we're teaching now. Those fools, what did they know? Whereas they're not going to laugh at the religion that is based on scripture, on truth, on our experience and the experience of those around us who have experienced God. I find it really tempting and therefore very dangerous to try to say, ah, the quantum uncertainty, that's where free will is. I don't think it's that easy. Uh, that, that's just another version of what they call the God of the gaps. Anything I don't understand, that's supposed to be where God is. Because if that's what you're basing your belief on God, when somebody else comes along with a better explanation, then suddenly you've lost your faith. And besides which, that's not a god of love. That's a god of, oh, making the, 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 the physics work. In the back, yes. What, you know, should we talk about uh, the necessary uh, sense of love, should that be taught in science classes? It should be taught in the university. There's too many things going on in the science class. Anyone who takes science should be aware that there's more to life than science. An awful lot of scientists don't know that, that's why we call them nerds. You know, I went to a school with a bunch of nerds, I am one. But that's why 
Even at MIT, you also take a humanities course at least once a semester. Because that's where you learn the other side, the side, the, the, the side of the desires as to why you become a scientist. I find it curious that most of the so-called new atheists, you know, Dawkins and, and uh, Hitchens and people like him, are not, first of all, they're not at all new. They're 19th century atheists. But what's more, an awful lot of them are British. And the one major flaw of the British education system is that they track people into the arts or the sciences at a very early age. And when you get to university, it's a rare scientist who gets to actually read philosophy and a rare philosopher who gets to learn science. Whereas the strength of the American system is, yeah, you have to take an astronomy course even if you're going to be a philosophy major. The medieval universities, in fact, had among the required courses for anybody doing theology or philosophy, you had to learn astronomy first. You had to learn music as well. These things are necessary to make all of it work. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be in the science classroom, but it has to be in a classroom that a scientist is going to be attending. Yes? Say again. Oh, what do I, what, how do I understand biblical inheritance, inerrance? Um, again, my tradition is very much in the Catholic stronghold. The Bible was not dictated word for word by God. Um, I understand that there are some Muslims who believe the Quran was dictated that way. The Bible wasn't. The version of the Bible that I hold in my hand is not even the original language it was written in. We may not even have the original language. We can argue whether, whether the Septuagint Greek version is more authentic than the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, for instance. All of that means that I have to say what is, inherent, what is inherently inerrant about the Bible? The truth that the Bible is trying to tell me. And the truth the Bible is trying to tell me are the very things that other things can't tell me. So that when the Bible is talking about creation, the seven days aren't the part that's inerrant. It's the fact that God did it. That's the part that it's inerrant. It's the unique stuff. To me, that's the important stuff. Because the rest of it was done by human beings and li limited by human language. The other thing to remember, if you study ancient languages, you know, I, I did a lot of uh, classic studies before I got into science. What's the oldest works that we have? The Iliad and the Odyssey? They're poetry. Um, the Psalms? They're poetry. Most Ancient literature started as poetry because this was before it was written down. That's how you remembered it. And as poetry, it's in the language of poetry because the really important things aren't found in the Volkswagen owner's manual. <laughs> the really important things are the things that can only be expressed by poetry. I remember talking to uh, a, a class at uh, Michigan Tech, which is up in Houghton, Michigan, in the middle of nowhere, wonderful place. And I said, you know, if you're madly in love, do you tell your beloved every time I see you, my pulse goes up 2.3%? <laughs> and a kid in the front row goes, yeah, I do. <laughs> Poetry gives us truth that cannot be communicated any other way. And that's the truth that is inerrant. Not the, not the, the, you have to remember, even science is Analogous. Even sign, even um, G, uh, F equals GMM over R squared, the Newton's law of gravity. That's not gravity. That's Newton's poetic way of saying gravity behaves kind of like if you had this mass times that mass divided by this distance. And it's a little bit in error, as we know from general relativity. And general relativity may be a little bit in error, or even a lot in error. But it's a poem. It's saying, it's, a, it's the metaphor. This equation is a metaphor for the way nature behaves. We always speak only in metaphors. We can't help but do that. Other questions? Yes? Can I explain the Pluto thing? <laughs> I'll try. Pluto was discovered 
because a mathematician said, I see a perturbation in the orbit of Neptune. I'll bet you there must be a big planet about 10 times the size of Earth right over there. Go look there. And after about 10 years of looking, somebody finally found something moving more or less where they said they should look. And they leapt to the conclusion, he predicted it should be there, we found it, that must be the planet. And then they started studying this body over the years and they discovered, well, it can't actually be 10 times the size of the Earth because if it were that big, it would have blunked out the star and it didn't. Maybe it's only one times the size. No, it can't be one times this. And finally, in 1978, they discovered a tiny moon going around it that made them realize, you know, actually, it's about 1% the size of the moon. How could that have possibly perturbed Neptune? Let's go back and see, well, you know what? Actually, Neptune wasn't perturbed. The mathematician made a mistake. There wasn't any planet out there. Well, what do we do with this thing now that we thought was 10 times the size of the Earth and now is you know, a, a, a fraction of the size of the moon? Well, it's the only one out there. Let's you know, keep calling it. Then they learned a little bit more about how planets are formed and how they behave, that the planets today are not in the orbits they were when they were formed. We've got a lot of ways of believing this. And as planets move, they move everything small nearby, either kicking them out of orbits or capturing them in a resonance and sho shoving them around. And they realized, you know, when Neptune moved, it dragged Pluto along with it. If you push Pluto out of its way, Neptune will yank it back into its original orbit. But if you push Neptune, Pluto will be dragged along. Okay, well, well Pluto's still bigger than any asteroid. It's nice and big and round. It's got geology going on its surface. So there's something interesting going on. And then, in 2005, a couple of astronomers discovered a handful of objects that were as big, or in one case, bigger than Pluto. And this created a very simple, silly, practical problem. There's a group called the International Astronomical Union, which is in charge of making arbitrary definitions so that when we say the Julian day began, everybody agrees what day it began on. When we say that this is the boundary of the constellation Ophiuchus, everybody agrees that's the constellation Ophiuchus. Totally arbitrary. You could have moved it a line one side or the other. We just all have to agree we're singing off the same page of the hymn book. This group is in charge of keeping track of the data for asteroids and the data for planets. Now the data for planets, is, you know, the orbital data is really important because planets push other things around. The orbital data for asteroids is not nearly as important because they shift with time. So you have to put a whole lot more effort into keeping the orbital data for planets. And there are two committees, one for naming planets and features on planets and one for naming asteroids and features on asteroids. Okay, who gets to name this body? That was the practical issue that the IAU was faced with. And somebody said, well, for you know, tradition's sake, why don't we do, call them all planets? We'll keep orbital data on all of them. Pretty soon it's going to be 20 or 30 guys that we keep, to keep orbital data on, and that's silly. Or let's call it an asteroid. Well, it's not actually an asteroid. It's bigger than an asteroid. You have to do a lot more study for its surface. And you do, asteroids are just piles of rock. It really is something different from either of those two things. And then somebody said, said to me, you know, as a planet, Pluto was always an ugly duckling. <laughs> but as a dwarf, it's the perfect example of what we're talking about. Let's create a third category. And the way that third category works, the names are decided on by a joint committee of both of those two. <laughs> The orbits are kept track of as if they're orbits of asteroids, because that's the easy way to do it. And we don't consider it a major planet anymore, but we also know that it's more than an asteroid. It's a third kind of body, a dwarf. And that's the answer. Any other questions? In that case, thank you all for coming. It was great to be here. <laughs>